You know, when polymaths were still a thing, those guys that did everything from mathematics to physics to sociology, philosophy, psychology, everything. Well, Francis Galton was a guy like that, and in 1880, he decided that he wants to study our imagination. Basically, how vivid are the images that we voluntarily produce in our heads when we daydream, for example. So, in what is now known as the famous breakfast study, he asked a hundred adult men to sit down with him and talk about the table at which they eat their breakfast every morning. From those participants, he wanted to gather relevant information about the sharpness, vividness and color of the, the images we produce in our daily lives. But what's particularly interesting about this study is that 12 men had great difficulties with providing him any information like, like that. that. They were, they didn't really tell him much. And well, that was quite intriguing. Why didn't they cooperate? Why, why did they refuse to imagine their breakfast table as it seems they had? Of course, there's many explanations and uh, jumping to the conclusion that they didn't see any image in their head, that would be quite a jump and um, no good explanation was given about those 12 men, but discussions moved on and it wasn't until 2009 that somebody, and that somebody's Bill 4, carried out a survey with 2,500 participants and asked them about, well, what are the images that you see in your head? How clear are they? If you close your eyes, can you imagine a red apple um, clearly? And it turned out that approximately 2% of those people self-reported to have no such images in the head once they closed their eyes. In 2010, there was another study by Adam Zeman and he reported on a 65 year old patient now he's known as the patient mx so for his whole life the patient reported he loved reading novels and he had routinely drifted off to sleep imagining buildings his loved ones and current events but after undergoing a procedure to open arteries in his heart during which he probably suffered a minor stroke his mind's eye went blind he could see normally, but he could not form pictures in his mind. So this was quite a new phenomenon, Zeman writes, and he has never encountered anything like it before. So in the article he proposes a name for this condition, aphantasia, after fantasia uh, imagination in Greek, and a being the prefix for without, so people without imagination, aphantasia. Publishing the paper in 2010 led to more people who recognized themselves in those descriptions contacting Zeman and he conducted a uh, vividness of visual imaginary questionnaire with them and which suggested that 21 of those people suffered from this condition as well. Uh, this is a uh, test that you can uh, do online right now actually. So. If you're interested, the link is in the description. It is a proven psychometric measurement for the intensity with which you can visualize setting people and objects in the mind. So if you have time and you're interested about your own capacities to produce images, link in the description. Describing our inner lives is difficult and undeniably prone to error. We use the same words to describe something that is essentially private, our private sensations of the world and we'd like to assume that when other people use those words they mean the same thing but obviously the same words can refer to different things so when I say red how do you ever know that you know my red is the same as what you mean when you say the word and this extends to a whole you know sphere of mental phenomena such as voluntary images that we produce in our heads. Usually people suffering from this condition don't realize it before their 20s or 30s. And usually they just assume that other people are talking in metaphors. For example, if I tell you right now to close your eyes and imagine walking on a beach, you might take me to just spitting some poetic nonsense. And um, well, people just got used to 
talking poetic nonsense like that because society. If this sort of skeptical challenge got you intrigued, please do check out my video on private language. But in this video, I want to know whether there is any kind of objective way to check whether people have mental images that they can voluntarily produce. Because we, we can't really rely on words, right? How do we know that people aren't just using different words to describe what is essentially the same mental experience? Or how do you know that they aren't simply bad at expressing themselves? Or that they are deceiving us? Or that they are having mental images but they aren't aware of them properly? The problem is that people who report having aphantasia can successfully solve problems involving visualization. For example, they know how a virtual object was rotated or for example, they know that a shade of green that they are being shown right now is darker than the previous one without comparing it apparently to a mental representation of that lighter shade of green in their head. You know, the blindness of their mind seems to have virtually no observable consequences. Well, in 2018, a study was published that actually managed to find a way to objectively prove that some people lack voluntary mental representations in their heads. To quote the introduction of the study, as congenital, uh, which is a birth defect, as congenital aphantasia has thus far been based on subjective reports, it remains unclear whether individuals are really unable to imagine visually or if they have very poor metacognition, which is the uh, awareness of mental phenomena. They have images in their mind but are blind to them. So what is the solution? How could we observe a person lacking mental imagery? Binocular rivalry, a phenomenon in visual perception where perception alternates between two different images presented to each eye. We can recreate this experiment with 3D glasses. So you probably have two eyes and they cooperate to create one unified image. But if you present a different image to each eye, then there's gonna be a natural pattern in which your mind and your eyes alternate between those two possible images and that natural pattern in which you know the binocular rivalry emerges can be influenced by concentrating on one of those two images so if we present a blue elephant to one eye and a red donkey to another eye and we ask the person to think of a blue elephant in their head that very act of having a mental image in your head will influence the pattern of the binocular rivalry in a way that we will be able to measure it. If you ask a person to think of a blue elephant and that very act of thinking will have a very visible and measurable effect on the natural pattern of the binocular rivalry, well then apparently there has been some mental activity going on in the brain that influenced that. And Science think that this has to be the act of visually representing that image in your head. So what's interesting here is that when scientists ask the people who reported to have aphantasia to think of a blue elephant, that act had no observable consequences for the binocular rivalry, the natural pattern in which the eyes alternated between those two ways of seeing it stayed the same. Whatever mental activity was going on in their brains, it had no effect on what their eyes were doing. And scientists conclude that this has to be because they are right, the patients. They have no mental images that would guide their eyes to pick out a blue elephant in their visual field. Yes, now we have a scientific experiment that can show that aphantasia, whatever it is, is not just people being unable to report on their mental activity. There's actually something different going on in their brain. And this was 2018. 
that was two years ago. I have been lucky enough to have seen it just when it came out two years ago and for the past two years it has opened up a whole new realm of skeptical challenges involving language, other minds, psychology, science, blah, blah, blah. The study of aphantasia is at the stage of a young science. It has been five years since the term was coined and the phenomenon has been given legitimacy in the eyes of science, legitimacy. <laughs> It has been two years since the binocular rivalry study and much more is left to be discovered. It's a whole new field and if you want to contribute to psychology, maybe now's the time. The phenomenon has been giving enormous attention from the media and I think that we're gonna hear a lot about it in the future because again, not a lot of study has been gone into the phenomena globally speaking and as it gets more and more attention more and more scientists will be drawn to the phenomena and boom you're gonna have an explosion of studies on the matter and then maybe in 10 or 20 years we're gonna have we're gonna look back at us and be like oof he said this about aphantasia <laughs> and it 20 years ago was so naive if only they would know what we know <laughs> but I guess they will have to wait for two decades or something for the big studies to come and that's it for today if you want to jump on the baby flapula train hop on because you are welcome special thanks to Ethan who suggested I should use his money on martinis and uh, Moscow mules and Douglas from New York, whose wife, ex-wife, is apparently another case study on the skepticism involving communication. Thank you for your donation.